night, it's Africa night, and we already know this is not a scientific event, but it's a fun event, and it was advertised by Stefano yesterday, so just dances and um, music. I wanted to comment on the activity we will have Wednesday afternoon, and people who were here last week know uh, what to expect, so we will have a panel discussion, and we will try to answer some of your questions which are not mathematical questions, by kind of career, progression, future. Uh, and uh, so mathematical questions, we are always very happy to receive them and do them at any time, especially during the exercise sessions. You can also ask us to repeat things. Let me stress it. It's really, we are really happy to explain. We are here to teach you something, so we are happy to uh, give everything. We, we can give you. And on the other hand, so this is, uh, if you, you should all have received the link last week in the email to this virtual pod where you can ask uh, questions. So these were the questions for week one. You can anonymously write whichever thing you may want addressed at the panel. So last week the panel was more about PhD and kind of early postdoc and kind of happily and successfully finishing a PhD and, and applying for jobs. Now it's more looking a little bit beyond, so for a little bit also more older people. Uh, the, the idea, the topic would be like how to become an independent researcher, how to develop your research agenda, and uh, also for later on how to combine family and work for men and women. <laughs> and, uh, how to, uh, and so if you have special questions you want answer, please go to the link and write whatever comes to your mind, okay? <laughs> okay, so maybe I can go back to the picture uh, of my slides. And uh, yeah, okay, maybe, yeah, let me just go. This is the slide from yesterday. And let me recall you, we were trying to character, it's okay, that's enough. We were trying to under characterize square cutting sequences obtained by crossing, uh, traveling along a irrational line. And again, the reference I'm actually following, essentially I'm doing an expanded version with more details, but all the ideas are in the first two pages of this beautiful paper by Caroline Siris. Then she goes on on Markov geometry of Markov numbers, but uh, 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 okay, there is a reference on the web page you can click on. Okay, uh, more serious details about uh, combinatorial properties and even the solution to the hard questions about complexity that I gave yesterday. There is this book by uh, uh, Arnoux, and there's also a link to Ferenczi that I might give you. Okay, let me recall you where we were. So first of all, we made some kind of elementary remarks just by staring at this uh, grid and you can find a necessary condition for a cutting sequence. So we call it admissibility and you cannot be admissible of type zero or admissible of type one. And admissible of type zero means that ones are isolated and the zero blocks have lengths k or k plus one, which differs by one at most one. And type one means that zeros are isolated, so we have one blocks, again, of length k or k plus one for some k. Yes? Yeah, so maybe, first of all, yeah, I could, I could put k greater than one. Uh, if you take k is equal to zero, uh, uh, so you have only one, one, yes, that's right, it will, yeah, so somehow when you decrease the type, at some point you swap to the other type, that's right. And again, let me recall you, maybe one thing I went fast in this proof, so I, I can assume that my angle is in between zero and pi half. That's just because of symmetries of the grid. I can always flip my trajectory. And then, uh, type zero and type one correspond to these two sectors, zero pi over four, and pi over four, pi over two. So if the slope, let's see, if the slope is less than one, then we are type uh, one. And if the slope is greater, then I hit, tend to hit two or more zeros. So this is type zero, okay? 
Okay, then we had, uh, this is all review because we stopped kind of in the middle. So then if I have an admissible sequence, I want to do a non-trivial operation, derivation. And you should think that this derivation is at the combinatorial level is a form of renormalization. So I'm kind of, I'm kind of, uh, how do I say? I'm kind of zooming out. So if I'm blind, and I don't see these small blocks, and I move back, I can see all these blocks as a single digits. So I'm kind of zooming out, actually. So in case zero, I replace every one zero to the k block with a one. That's what we said. So let me do an example. If this is my sequence, every, so sorry, we are in case zero, so we replace one, here k is three, so I replay this block, I see it as a one, and this extra one, no, this block, uh, did I do it right? Uh, one, yeah, that block is a one, this block is another one, and the, the extra zero stays a zero. So sorry, this block is a one, then I have a big block which is a one, and uh, another block which is a one, another block which is a one, and then this extra zero stays a zero. Okay. So, and I, I didn't say it yesterday, but this definition has another half. So if you are in case one, you should do something similar for the other type. So in case one, you want to replace zero, one, 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 k times with zero. And again, maybe let me do another example. So if I have 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, 1, omega prime is 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, and so on. Okay? Where? Uh, ah, here. Thank you. Yeah, here, here. So uh, that's a one, and that's another one. Yes. And you can check, maybe a remark to remark, when you do this, you flip type. So when you derive, you will get something of the, well, you flip type. In, in, okay. If you are, again, admissible, it will be admissible of the other type. In general, you may not be admissible. In my case, this is not admissible, so this is not, omega will not be a cutting sequence. Uh, no, so there are different conventions of how you, this is like, a, what's going to be a death substitution, and then we can do the opposite. You can choose either one, but you have to do it consistently. And I hope I will do it consistently later, but <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, you can do, there are yeah, different conventions also here. Okay, so now the main theorem. So the main theorem that I, that I stated two theorems, and the idea is that uh, admissibility is not enough to characterize cutting sequences, it's just a local condition. But when I do this operation of derivation, if I impose admissibility on infinitely many scales, on the deri derived sequence, on the derived sequence of the derived sequence, if it's infinitely derivable, so if every time I derive, I get back something admissible and I can derive again, then this, this actually, first of all, uh, uh, it, this is um, true for cutting sequences. So cutting sequences, I can, derive them infinitely many times and get always admissible sequences. Cutting sequences are infinitely derivable. And now you can ask me, is this a characterization? So is an if and only if? And it's almost an if and only if. So it's if and only if, if you take the closure. If and only if, omega belongs to the closure of square cutting sequences. And what is the closure? This is the closure in the space, if you want, 0, 1 to the z. 
Last week we had the distance and we had the topology. So if you kind of take sequences which can be approximated as limit of cutting sequences, this becomes if and only if. And I'll have you an exercise to think about if you can find something which is in the closure but is not a cutting sequence. But you can actually understand exactly what's in the closure and there are kind of, uh, so it's essentially you can understand the closure so you can really characterize cutting sequences through infinitely derivable. And not only that, but given a cutting sequence, if I tell you that a sequence passed my test and is a cutting sequence, but I don't know which line generated it, I can recover the direction from the combinatorial process of deriving. And this is the thing, I take my cutting sequence. By theorem one, it's infinitely derivable. So I start deriving. And I record the values. So A0 is the block, the block's value of the sequence. A1 is the block, I derive and I look at the length of the blocks of the derivative and so on. And as I do this, type flips. So it will be type 0, type 1, type 0, type 1, but I just record the value. And the second theorem tells me that the tangent of the slope is actually given by the continuous fraction with those values as entries. Okay? okay. Yes, yeah, so this is k's. These are the k's. I call them A to make them continued fraction, but these are the k's. K's. Okay? Sorry? Uh, yeah, but it's not, enough. well, we will understand better through the proof, but in some sense, I'm just thinking blindly. You see, it, it reduces the length, of it. the word is infinite, but if I look at a finite block, I'm making it shorter, and it looks like I'm here, and then at some point I go back. It's the opposite, actually, it's kind of a zooming out. Last week we were zooming in, but this is zooming out. But I'm kind of going out and the kind of roughly thinking of each of these blocks as a single, single letter. So it just, I'm just saying that it looks at different scales. Does it make any sense? Okay, so now we are ready for the proof. And now for the proof, I want to state a key lemma. And we'll first deduce everything from the key lemma and then prove the key lemma. So this is really the key point. So you have omega, say, of type, uh, which type do I want? Type zero with value, uh, with value, value k. And now I'm going to consider the following matrix. Zero, sorry, one, zero, k, one. Maybe I'll call it a k. Hope I have the right matrix. One, zero, k, one, yes, hopefully. And if it's type one, I will only write the statement for type zero. If it's type one, you have to take the transpose of this matrix. And let lambda k, you remember that lambda was my grid? Lambda k is a k of the grid. So what, let me do an example. If k is equal to 3, this is my grid. So I apply 1, 0, 3, 1. And I can always make mistakes, and you're very good at spotting them, but hopefully, uh, 1, 0 goes to uh, 3, 1, you can check. So my grid will be actually like this. Will be a skewed grid which is very much same horizontal lines, but the vertical lines have slope 3. Okay? So this is, do you see the picture? I oh, don't have an animation, but. So lambda k is a skewed grid. Okay. Uh, did I do it right? I hope yes. Yes. Okay. 
And actually, you can get it like this. You can take uh, your square and apply the matrix uh, 1, 0, 1, 1. And you will get a grid which has, as fun, you can think, as a base a parallelogram. And then you can iterate this uh, three times. So basically, this matrix is shearing. It's shearing your uh, square up by one, and you do it three times, and you get this skewed grid. Uh, sorry, this example was an aside. So the key lemma, let me go back to the key lemma. So IK is this, then uh, omega prime, the derived sequence, is the cutting sequence of the same line L, L, with respect to lambda K, skewed grid. So what do I mean? I have my line, L, or maybe I'll do it, sorry, my line should be sloped. Um, okay, my line is actually like this. My line it has a slope kind of three, integer part three. And instead of recording intersections with respect to the squares, I want to record the intersection with respect to this skewed grid. So I will still record zero for horizontal and one for diagonals, for these uh, sides, okay? So I forget about the square grid. I only have the green grid. And as I travel around this green grid, I record zero, one, zero, one, according to how I hit the sides of the parallelograms. Th does it make sense? Do you understand what, what the statement is? The statement is the derived sequence has a geometric meaning. It is a cutting sequence, but not with a unit grid, but with respect to a skewed grid. Make sense? So this is what we are going to prove a little bit later. Because I will start with using this lemma and telling you that once we have this, we are done. Well, once we have these, we have our renormalization machine. Sorry? What? K. K is integer, is the value. So it's a positive integer. The same than the length of the blocks. So first I want a corollary. I want, uh, this is what we will prove. But how we will use it is we will use the corollary. So the corollary, uh, uh, actually I'm going to write the proof of the corollary. So if I have my line L and I have my grid, lambda K, which is AK of lambda, and it's skewed. Ah, oh, sorry, let me draw it more, more slanted. Let me draw this grid like this. What happens if I apply AK inverse? So what happens if I apply AK inverse to lambda K? I want to straighten my picture. So if I apply AK inverse, uh, I go back to lambda. What happens if I apply AK inverse to my line? Well, it, it moves. It moves to some new line, which will be uh, actually something like this. And this is lambda prime, which is AK inverse of lambda. OK? So I have this skewed picture. I straighten it. And this time, I change my line. So maybe I will write a corollary now. So when you do an affine transformation to, or linear transformation to your picture, cutting sequences don't change. If I change the grid and the line, the cutting sequence of 
L with respect to, or maybe let me, first the corollary, maybe write a remark. Let's go slowly because it's really simple. Cutting sequences of L with respect to L K is the same than the cutting sequences of L prime with respect to lambda. Do, do you believe this? I'm not doing anything less than deforming my picture, but the cuttings are the same. Okay, so this is very important. So these linear operations don't change cutting sequences. So there, something non-trivial happened. There, I related derivation with the same line with respect to a new grid. Now I'm doing something trivial. I'm just deforming um, to, to make it square again. So the corollary of the lemma, so the corollary, corollary of lemma plus remark, is that omega prime derived sequence is the cutting sequence, is again a cutting sequence. It's again a cutting sequence because it's the cutting sequence, it's the cutting sequence of lambda prime. It's again, sorry, it's again, let me stress it, it's again a square cutting sequence. It's again a square cutting sequence because it's the cutting sequence of lambda prime with respect to the unit grill. With respect to lambda. Is it clear what's happening? So I have a sequence, I derive it. If I show that it's the cutting sequence of the same line with respect to the skewed grid, with respect to the parallelogram grid, then I can straighten it and I can find a new line whose cutting sequence with the unit square grid is the derivative. Okay? So do you see why we are done? Can anybody prove theorem one now? Why cutting sequences are infinitely derivable? Huh? Yes? Yes? So do you remember what we showed yesterday, that if I have a cutting sequence by elementary inspection, I know that it's admissible. So now L prime will be at the, the omega prime, because it's a cutting sequence of a line, another line, but it's again admissible. So it has this property that uh, zeros and ones comes in blocks, which are the integer part of the new slope. So proof of theorem one, proof of theorem one would be just that um, uh, so omega is admissible because it's a cutting sequence. Again, cutting sequence implies admissible. So then omega prime by corollary is also cutting sequence, a square cutting sequence. So this implies also admissible. So I can derive it. So I can consider omega prime. And again, uh, you can repeat. Using the key lemma again. So omega prime, you repeat, and it's again, it's a cutting sequence of some lambda two. And this is so admissible and so on. Does it make sense? Okay, so being a cutting sequence guarantees admissibility. So if each derivative is a cutting sequence, each derivative is admissible and I can derive it again. Okay. And now for theorem two, to, for theorem two, so let's do to proof of theorem two, I just need to compute for you what is, uh, so I'll compute, uh, theta prime direction of L prime. 
I want to compute what's the direction of L prime, okay? So what is the direction of L prime? Um, okay, so now I hope I don't get it wrong because it's, so it's, I have to apply one zero uh, K one to say cosine sine to see where the direction go. Cosine sine theta, so I get what? I get cosine theta over k cosine. Ah, sorry, sorry, sorry. I have to compute the inverse because I'm applying a k inverse. I'm applying the inverse, so I have a minus. And this is k minus k cosine plus sine. And this I can write as, let's say, 1 over tangent theta minus k. Okay. Maybe I'll write it here. Ah, the key lemma we want to keep. Maybe I'll write here. Okay. Okay, so the tangent of theta prime is related to the tangent of theta. Ah, sorry, sorry. Oh. This is badly written. This is the linear map, but I'm already taking the ratio, so uh, okay, maybe I shouldn't. Well, that's okay. I hope you understood what I meant. I first do this computation, and then I find that the tangent of theta prime, which is sine over cosine, is actually this. Well, hopefully it's not. Uh, what did I do? I took cosine over sine. So is this tangent or cotangent? Uh, cotangent. I apply to cosine and sine, and I get cosine prime and sine prime, and then I take the ratio, so I get the cotangent. So let's see if I can uh, get it right. So tangent theta, I can write my original tangent theta, I can solve for tangent theta, and I get one over cotangent. I think, I guess, um, tangent is, huh? was it right with tangent? I would be happy if it's right with tangent. <laughs> huh? Yes, that's right. I would be happier, yes, because I would like to see this. No. I think that's what I want to see. Or maybe with cotangent and then, or maybe it's k plus cotangent. It was cotangent. Okay, maybe I should leave this as an exercise. You should cover, recover the. It is cotangent, but then I can write it as this. There's another inverse, so plus tangent. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, okay, but then I think tangent of theta prime will be. Uh, something which is less than one, because you kind of flip type. And then you kind of, if you want, you can uh, also flip uh, the line. Uh, so, okay. so first of all, this k, first of all, let me say that this k was actually the integer part of tangent, which if you want, you can call it's a zero in my expression. And then you want to prove that this one, again, you can write it. If you want, at this point, you can flip uh, at x is equal to y, and from L prime, you can look at this uh, 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 L prime flipped, and this is, oh, I'm confusing everybody now again. This is k plus 1 over tangent uh, of theta prime flipped. So this is going to be something greater than 1, and then you can repeat by finding the integer part, and. Okay, I leave you, yes. So, I see, so there is this issue that each time you flip sectors, so when you derive a, a, a sequence which is of slope greater than one, you actually get, uh, so when you derive a cutting sequence of type one, you get a cutting sequence of type zero. And this corresponds to this line flipping from being greater than one and less than one. 
So if you want to take integer part to see, if you want your slope to be greater than one and see the, the, the value as the integer part, it's convenient to flip your line from less than one to greater than one. So this is, if you want, if I have it like this, this will be a number less than one. So to find the value, you can also think of it like this. This is a, a slope which is less than one, so to find the value, I need to take the integer part of one over because it's horizontal. So I need to take one over and see how many times I cross. Or you can flip it and then have value greater than one, which maybe you immediately see the integer part appearing. Okay, I think we did it right. Maybe I confused you, but I think it's correct. And if you repeat this again by induction, you finish the proof. Get theorem two. Great, so we are left with the key lemma. So the key lemma um, is, uh, actually if you read this Caroline series papers, I find it slightly annoying because she says essentially everything which I said today uh, and yesterday, but just much faster. But then she tells you by inspection, you can look at uh, the uh, cutting sequence with the skewed grid and convince yourself that it's a derivative, which I find it's a little bit of a lie because actually I try to tell some undergraduate students, fill the details and they always get confused. So let me give you one, how I see it very clearly. So, so actually I think it's really nice and convenient to think of this 0, no, 1, 0, k, 1, to break it up into smaller steps and to think of it as 1, 0, 1, 1, power k. And analyze just the effect of a single shear, which is much easier to analyze. So what's happening? I have my square and I have my line which is slope greater than 1. Ah, this picture is already not good. I need some space. I have my square, and I have my line, and then I have my, oh, again, it's not big enough. <laughs> I want to have two squares. I need to draw two squares. Okay. <laughs> and then I have, <coughs> <coughs> I think I need green for my skewed green, right? So this is like this lambda green, is like uh, one, zero, one, one applied to lambda is in green, okay? So I just do one step and then we'll repeat and see what is the effect of one step when I have to record my sequence. So I want to, so my original cutting sequence I was coding with zero and ones. And now what I need to do, okay, so the ones are the same. So the ones are the same. Because I didn't change the ones. But instead of recording the horizontal with zero, I need to record the diagonal with zero. Okay, so diagonal gives, diagonal gives, uh, uh, and now I'm going to call it the green zero. So I just want to record when I hit the diagonal, okay? I want to ignore when I hit the horizontal and just look at the diagonal. And now maybe we can just draw one square and one diagonal. So now you really have to do elementary inspection. So I have zero, zero. White, white, white one, and here I have a green one. Maybe it's not. <laughs> eh? Okay, so maybe I, I will uh, call it two. Should I call it two? So now I want to code into zero, two instead of zero, one. So what do you remark? So what do you remark? That each, if I cross, if my trajectory crosses, um, my trajectory is a slope greater than one. So if it crosses zero, zero, so between two, between, between uh, zero, zero, there is, there is a, a two. 
2, I will still do it green. So between 0, 0, there is a 2. But if I have a 1 and a 0, but between 1 and 0, no. None. So again, if I go from 0 to 0, I'm bound to hit the 2. If I go from 1 to 0, I don't hit the diagonal. Whichever my slope, my, whichever my position of the initial point is, but if my slope is greater than 1. So what do I uh, notice? My original cutting sequence was like, was like this, 0, 0, 0, 1. So if I now put the tools in between, so there's no two here, but there is, so ones are the same. I have to keep the ones, and between two zeros, I put a two. So here, and here, and here. And I can drop the zeros, because I don't care about the zeros anymore. Okay? So do you notice what happened of the length of the block? What happened is that, uh, oh sorry, by the way, this two should be, it's actually my new zero, so I shouldn't have called it one by zero. So now, if you call the two, you can call it new zero, so. Mod, mod two. Huh? Mod two. Mod two, yes, thank you. <laughs> okay, but in any case, what I wanted to say is that now the length of the block decreased by one. So, so call, so two, call it, Call it uh, zero, and then we have that you have something like one, zero, 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 one. So because I, I only hit it in between two, so the length of the block reduced by one. And then you repeat k times. And again, maybe I leave you to convince yourself of the details. But now I think this elementary step is much easier than do them all at once. And I do have an animation. So I showed it to Irene yesterday. And she told me, don't show the animation, do it on the board. But I still did the animation, so <laughs> let me. So this is the cutting sequence. Actually, my animation is the other one, is for the slower, for the horizontal slope. Just because horizontal, I have more space. So this is my cutting sequence with respect to 0 and 1, to the square. And I add to the diagonal, which is green, so green 1. Sorry, here, that's why you were confused. And uh, now you notice that uh, when I cross between two ones, between two blue ones, I have a green 1. And between 0 and 1, or 1 and 0, I don't cross the diagonal. So I add this green 1 in my augmented sequence, I add a one in between each blue, I add a green one between blue ones, sorry. And geometrically, you can actually cut your square and transform it into a parallelogram by taking this triangle and moving it on the other side. And now, if I, this is the parallelogram I want to use to code. I want zeros and green ones, so I drop the blue ones. And if I want to, I can already renormalize at each stage. So this parallelogram, I can map it back by applying the inverse. I can map it back to the square, changing my slope. And actually, the slope in this operation changed by the Fari map. So if you remember the Fari map, if you do k iterates of the Fari map, you will get the Gauss map. But it's a kind of slow version of a renormalization. And, uh, um, OK, so OK, now I, 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 reno, I put it back into a square, and I can change green to blue. And you see this new sequence has blocks with, here the blocks had 2 and 3. Here the blocks have 1 and 2. So the blocks decrease by 1. And then you can, blocks are shorted by 1, and you can repeat k times. And your block is shortening each time, OK? OK, so hopefully. I, so when did I start? At, OK, I have 10 minutes more, right? So now it's going to be like a fun, fun. Um, so I finished what um, I wanted to really teach slowly about Sturmian sequences. 
And, ah, well, I didn't. I wanted to say, oh, I see, I forgot. <laughs> I wanted to say about substitution, but maybe, uh, what do we do? Uh, okay, maybe I will, uh, okay, maybe I will just say one thing. I will tell you what a substitution is, so I can give you, in the exercise, an equivalent rephrasing of this theorem. So maybe let me do this. Uh, okay, so we have 10 minutes. I don't think I can do everything. We'll see. Okay, substitution. So there is a more concrete way to actually uh, produce these cutting sequences because derivation is like a test. But how do you actually build such sequences? So if you want to build them, it's more useful to do something which is like an anti-derivation. So a substitution, sigma, uh, it's a map from letters, say 0, 1 in my case, to words in 0, 1. So, okay, I will not do, uh, maybe we'll do, okay. I will do just this, I will do substitution because then I want to give you an exercise. Okay, so let me give you an example. Let me have the substitution which I'm calling sigma 0. So sigma zero could be saying, I could say that sigma zero, I have to tell you what it does on zero and what it does on one. And I can say that sigma zero is uh, uh, fixed, sigma zero is fixed and maps into itself and one becomes uh, uh, zero one. Okay. And now you can, Sigma acts, acts on bi-infinite sequences. By substituting each letter. By substituting, substituting each letter. For example, let me just tell you what is sigma of a finite block, like 0, 0, uh, uh, for example, what is sigma 0 of, uh, I don't know, 1, 1, 1, I guess I want to do this. What is sigma 0 of the periodic sequence 1, 1, 1, 1? Or maybe let me do something else. Sigma 0 of 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, 0. So as I, uh, this, my sequence could be by infinite, but let's just look at a finite piece. What happens when I go through my sequence? Each one, I replace it with zero, 1, and each zero I keep. So this is zero, 1, zero, 1, zero I keep, zero, 1, zero, 1, zero I keep, and so on. Okay? You can substitute each letter. Okay? And then, and then you can actually uh, iterate uh, the substitution and apply it again, for example. So uh, actually, let me write, just for curiosity, let me write the k power. So sigma 0 to the k is sigma 0 composed with sigma 0 k times. What does it do on zero? Nothing. What does it do on ones? So one, each one produces zero one. Then the zero stays and the one produces zero one. So you can convince yourself that this is zero to the k one. And you might notice that these blocks look like, the substitution looks a little bit like an anti-derivation. So derivation was taking blocks of this form and shrinking. This substitution is taking letter and expanding them. And there is a pair substitution. So there is companion substitution sigma 1, which does uh, the opposite. So 1 is fixed. I hope I didn't get them wrong, but I'm, I think it's swapped, so it's uh, one zero. I will check them later for the exercise. Okay, zero, one, one, zero, uh, zero, one. Okay, so sigma zero and sigma one 
are called Sturmian substitutions. Not surprising, because you will see. And you can write the following theorem three, which is you can deduce from theorem two, and this is what I will ask you to do. So omega is a square cutting sequence. Uh, it's a, or maybe if you want, it's in the closure of the square cutting sequence, if and only if. If and only if I can get it by, in some sense, applying the substitutions. I want to produce this sequence. And I write, actually, first I will write an expression which maybe is not so clear, but maybe I will write two, is two ways of writing this. You can write it like this. You can write it as intersection in N of the following thing. Uh, and actually, at me, let me add, in, in direction theta, theta which is equal to a0, a1, dot, 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 dot. If and only if, I can write it like this as, so I have to put last sigma 0 to the a0. Then I have to put sigma 1 to the a1. Then I have to put sigma 0 to the a2. So I alternate the types 0, 1, and the powers are the continued fraction entries. And I will stop at, uh, well, anything, uh, an, and then put 0, 1 to the z. So that means there exists a sequence so that I can apply the substitutions in this order and uh, uh, get my sequence. A2, AN, uh, ah, sorry, this is either 0 or 1. Uh, this is 0, 1 according to parity of N. AN, AN, power AN. AN are the entries of the continuum. Oh, <laughs> yes, we can write it like this. Sigma 0 to the 2N. That's what you wanted, right? Yes. And actually, another way to say this, you can think of it, I'm going to write a limit, and this maybe looks more constructive. So you can start from, say, if I'm with 0, you can start with the periodic sequence of 1s. So this is 1 periodic. Apply sigma 0 to the a n, dot, 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 backward up to sigma 0 to the and put sigma 1 to the a1, and dot, 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 dot. And so basically, OK, what am I saying? And I have an exercise. I really want you to try to do this yourself. Start from a block of ones. Apply these substitutions from n to 0. And then start from 2n. Sorry, this was a 2n. And then repeat the same thing starting from 2n plus 2 and going backward. What you will notice that the sequences that you are getting have longer and longer common blocks. So if I start very far and apply these substitutions, they are made so that they kind of uh, expand. The, 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 they have a common central block. So if I fix, uh, I start from 1, 1, 1 from 2n, and I start with the same thing up to uh, I add sigma 1 to, to the n plus 1 and sigma 0 to the 2n plus 2 and take 1, 1, 1, 1 periodic. These two sequences have a common central block. So this limit is, again, a limit in the, in the sigma 2 topology. So that means that sequences share longer and longer central blocks. So this is somehow a constructive way to build your sequences. If I want to build a cutting sequence in a certain slope, I compute my continued fraction entries. And I take, if I want a finite block, I will just have to uh, take a sufficiently large n and do this process to an initial word. And my word will get quite long and contain. 
Okay, so I think I will uh, have to stop here, but I will give you some exercises where I just I want you should just try yourself to apply some of the substitutions and see how they work, and you will have a way to build Sturmian sequences. So I like this theorem in some sense because it's more constructive, so it allows you to really build them, while the previous theorem is more uh, geometric characterization, but. And you can actually quite easily deduce theorem three from theorem two, of theorem one, one and two, yeah. <laughs> so this will be also a challenge, not too deep, but a uh, good exercise to try, okay? And tomorrow I will start my lecture by telling you, this is just for fun, but I will show you some slides and um, I will tell you that you can do the same for not only for the square, but you can do the same, for example, for other regular polygons like the octagon. And I will show you some slides of my talk. So you see that this is not too far. There's still some quite recent research which builds upon this. And then we will move to translation surfaces and interval exchange maps. And what do you do when you cannot renormalize geometrically so nicely? Yeah.